This is Chris Shelton, and I am joined this week by Sarah Edmondson, writer of a book called Scarred, survivor of a group called Nexium, something that a lot of you might know something about since we have done earlier podcasts talking about that topic, its relationship or uh, common ground with Scientology in many, many ways. And uh, Keith Ranieri, or how, now, uh, Sarah, welcome to the show first off, and then Thank I'm going to start plying you with questions. Uh, so, hello, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry it's you. taken so long, but here we are. Here we are, and no worries at all. Um, I know you're a very busy person, and also with my studies and stuff, I have been too. So, uh, so many things to talk about, and I'm guessing that I might want to have you back because there's no way in the time we have we're going to be able to cover everything I want to talk about with you. Um, First off, though, for people, we have to cover some ground that you have covered so many times and that has been, you know, well trod only because not everybody who's tuning into this is going to be familiar with all the backstory of this like you and I are. So in, I suppose, in brief, but, you know, as much as you would like to uh, provide, what's the basic backstory here in terms of what is Nexium, the group you were part of? Who's this guy, Keith, who was in charge of it, and how did you get in and and out of that? <laughs> I know. <laughs> about 12 years in the, in the Two sentences bite. or less. <laughs> yeah, that's why I wrote the book. No, it's just so I could hand it to people and, and not talk about it anymore. But I have distilled it down to some, some cliff notes. Um, no. Basically, the long and short of it is I, I joined... Nexium, when it was, well, I thought I was joining a personal and professional development program. It was called Executive Success Programs. It, it's known in the media as Nexium, but that wasn't a, a, even a word that I was aware of at the time. And it mm. was a five day training, uh, ESP, Executive Success. And I thought I was doing a success program. And it was for my uh, my growth. And I met I met a filmmaker named Mark Vicente, who who is also in the Vow, and he had made this film called what the bleep do we know? And he said, if you like my film, which I did, and I really admired him, he said, you, you'll probably like this workshop I just took. No, he was also a new student. He um, didn't know the, what was going on behind closed doors, which we get to later. And um, he brought me in. I loved it. I, you know, went from being very skeptical, lots of red flags. I didn't know were red flags at the time to trusting Mark, sticking it out to day three by day five. I was totally hooked. I found my, my tribe, my people had a whole new worldview, and I thought if everyone had this, um, world leaders would get along and there'd be peace on earth. That's right. what I thought. Right. And so I was like, oh, it took me a little bit of time um, to decide to become a coach, but eventually I did, and I went back and forth between Vancouver and New York, decided I wanted to open the first center in Canada. I'm very determined and stubborn, so I did four years later. And um, never moved to the mothership of Albany, New York, where the, where the, uh, the group is, um, based, but I did take many trainings. I went up the ranks, uh, like the martial arts style of ranking system. And this whole thing is run by a man named Keith Ranieri, who is the philosophical founder. And we called him Vanguard, which obviously should have been a major red flag. And it was, but all of the things that are weird about this particular group were all preempted on the day one in a class called Rules and Rituals. And it was presented like this. Can you think of three places in society where we have a special name for a title where somebody has earned a rank, like your honor or doctor or professor? So we call Keith Ranieri Vanguard, which means leader of a philosophical movement. And we call Nancy Salzman the head of the school prefect because it means head of the school. So all these things that are like super weird sashes. Well, we have martial arts. We have different levels of growth. It's the same thing in executive success. You start off as a white, and then you become a yellow. And then when you graduate, you become an orange, and then you become a green. I worked my way all the, all the way up to green, which was, at the time that I left, the highest active rank other than Keith and Nancy, although I was the lowest rank within that rank because there's stripes as well. And, oh, man, what was the question? How did I get in? Because that's how I got in. Yes. How I, how I got out. Um, was 
I mean, people ask me this all the time. What were the red flags? How did you wake up? I had red flags from the beginning, but I learned also from day one to cover up that feeling because they said to us, and this is how I think a lot of groups like this work, you're going to feel uncomfortable. We're going to be talking about your issues, which is what you're paying money to overcome. When you feel uncomfortable, you'll probably want to leave and stuff your face with donuts or whatever you do to feel better. Smoke a cigarette, go flirt with someone. We're asking you to not do that and to sit in your discomfort because no pain, no gain, right? You got to break out your com- out of your comfort zone. And there's truth in that. But mixed with that is the visceral discomfort I had because something wasn't right. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I ultimately, I trusted Mark and I trusted, I mean, I, I had zero ability to project the leadership's capacity to lie or to present something false which I now see everywhere, (laughs) unfortunately. But at the time, I was very trusting, very idealistic, looking for community, looking for uh, fitting in, wanting to be special, all the things I wanted this group provided. And those things also overrode that gut instinct, which I had to override if I wanted to grow. I was paying good money. I committed to at the beginning that I was going to override that feeling, not understanding I was overriding my compass, my compass of morality and my compass and my gut instinct. So from that point on, I was committed. Anything that that didn't seem right to me, if I went upline to in the ranking system, I was gaslit and would be met with an answer like, well, why, what's what's going on for you that you'd bring that up right now? You, there we go. Right, you, yeah, yep. you, seem, you seem really reactive. Have you gotten an EM? Could you talk to your coach about that? So it's always flip back. I, in my book, I call it the Nexium flip. Um, I had no idea that was a thing that people did <laughs> who are sociopaths and don't want to take responsibility. So there was this closed loop system of logic where you could never question. And if you did, you got in trouble, or you're punished, or you're demoted. And ultimately, I, in retrospect, now that I understand about course of control and cultic abuse and all those things, is that really, I was obedient externally. I was a good girl. I followed all the rules. And when I was in Albany, I did all the things, but my little community in Vancouver, because nobody higher rank than me was there. I got, I kind of ran it my own way and I picked and chose the good stuff and didn't do a lot of the other stuff. Like I got in trouble actually once and I'm tangenting here, but I'll circle back. I promise. Nancy Salzman came out when, when time to do like a presentation and she got, I got in trouble for not paying her enough tribute publicly. Like we're supposed to just have constant adulation for the leaders. And anyway, long story short, um, I had major red flags over the years, couldn't wrap my head around certain things that I saw, was probably on my way out three years before I left when I had my first child and my priorities shifted. That's when they promoted me to the rank of green to keep me in, to keep me hooked. And they did because I was really wanting that green sash. And um, again, as I was starting to lose interest and not grow. They invited me to um, a women's group within the organization. I didn't know it was part of the organization. In fact, it was pitched as me as nothing to do with the organization. A women's group that would be the next level of my growth and would challenge me in ways I never could have imagined. I don't know how much detail you want to go into this part of it, with, but ultimately that involved me getting uh, what I thought was supposed to be a tattoo as part of a secret initiation ceremony with my quote sisters the night of found it was a uh, found out it was a brand and was told it was a symbol for the four elements but actually what really woke me up was a few weeks later finding out that the symbol was not for the four elements but actually for Keith Raniere's initials right and that was the, the you know obviously <laughs> it, people had said that we were a cult the whole time in fact we got trained in our first 5 day what to say if people say we were a cult so I all of a sudden knew in that moment that after all of those years uh, that they were right. It was a cult and it was actually talking to um, Mark Vicente openly and freely about, um, you know, everything that I was seeing and that he was seeing that we were able to put all the pieces together and we were then able to understand what it was. And that's how I woke up. There we go. Yeah, is that a good summary? It actually is a wonderful summary, and it highlights a couple of things I'd like to ask about or or highlight even further. Yes. 
um, one, the social dynamics of the situation about, uh, and I'm, I'm going to do throughout this, I will bring up comparisons to Scientology just because it's convenient and it's because something it's my, that my audience is super familiar with. Um, the 75% of people who come into Scientology come in through friends and family. Oh, really? Not through the personality tests or the street book sales or that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Three out of four are brought in by somebody they already know and trust. Mm -hmm. As uh, you mentioned in your thing, you had this relationship with Mark or you knew him, you trusted him, he brought you into this. And I wonder how much of that in retrospect do you think was what kept you on board despite the red flags and the, you know, sort of signs that if he had, like, if he hadn't been there, if other connections hadn't been there, would it have been easier for you to see more clearly I what was so. going on? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it also, if I didn't have that, him to sort of share those things, he was really the only person above me in rank that I could share. Like, I don't, this is something I don't feel good about. He didn't necessarily um, gaslight me because he didn't know all either. <laughs> and he would be like, yeah, that's, you know, like he, I felt like pretty safe to talk to him, right. but also I trusted him and he was closer to Keith than I was. So a lot of my weirdness around Keith, like I didn't have the same, I didn't put Keith on the same pedestal as many people did. Mm. If anything, I put Lauren and Nancy on that pedestal. I, I just realized when you asked me the story, the sort of summary of it, I guess the one kind of the, the the last three chapters part is the way the wake up went from, you know, holy shit, we got to get out of here to we got to expose this guy to basically making our and with the same veracity, we were building Nexium. We were now destroying Nexium. And that led to a New York Times article, which got the authorities involved, which led to a very fast trial. I mean, the trial itself was long and plenty of due process, but things moved quickly. It was an expedited uh, process to get him taken out of Mexico where he was hiding. <laughs> and um, anyway, he's in jail for 120 years. So right. that, just to wrap up the rest of the, the, the rest of the story for those who aren't familiar with. Yes. The journey. Did I do okay with that summary? You did. You did wonderfully. Right. And it, and it does. And especially because it does have a, a kind of a happy ending and yes. And in fact, that's that was what got me thinking about talking about that ending more so than the beginning. You have covered so extensively in your book. It has been so well reported in the New York Times and other places. There's a there are two full length you know documentaries about this on on um, what is it Showtime and Netflix and you know there's just a lot of stuff out there's there a lot about of content on Nexium. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, about the group itself, its abuses, who Keith was, how he came to power. That's well covered territory and and territory that I'm that I, I've certainly covered here and I'm not disinterested in, but I think that there's a much more interesting part of this, which you can speak to uniquely, which is the end act of the, the final part of this whole thing, because you've actually contributed greatly to shutting this thing down. Mm -hmm. And that's something that hasn't happened for Scientology, for the JWs, for the 12 tribes, for so many other abusive groups out there that still get to get away with what they're getting away with. So I thought I might talk to you about that bit. Sure. You, because it's kind of important. You know? it's it's, like, it really is the most important. And it actually yeah. drives me to keep doing these interviews and to keep talking about it because we were really lucky. And I think part of the reason it did happen that way is, I mean, it's a much smaller group, much less influential. I know that Scientology and the Mormon church in particular, um, I haven't done a deep dive into JW yet. It's on my list. Um, is just there's, there's really influential people in positions of power and yep. the whole freedom of religions act is that that's right right. right so we didn't have that keith he couldn't have made it a religion because his whole thing was that we needed a curriculum that was away from religion so that we could all get along and have world peace so oh i didn't was, realize he had an anti-religion message in there well, too it wasn't so much anti-religion he's like we need a place where jews and christians and muslims etc can come together and have a dialogue right. and a foundation of understanding that's not based in religion interesting Interesting. So but he made it, it, he, it he made it a feature. Like, but, yes, he made a feature, but it was also um it, it was not consistent because it was 
taught and practiced like a religion, right. <laughs> you know? Right. So it, it wasn't a, consi- there's, and there were so many inconsistencies. We could do a, a full one hour of just the inconsistencies, I'm sure as we could with, with Scientology right. um, on next year. But yeah, no, it is, it is the most important thing to me. And I, and I also think he got away with it for so many years because he had influential people um, that were quite wealthy, you know, greasing the wheels in the small little area that he lived. He didn't have the reach of Scientology in, in the right. Mormon church. He, he was just, he was a very small, unsuccessful cult, really, if you think about it, because it never, I mean, we don't actually know for sure. Only somewhere between 17,000, max 20,000 people took their curriculum. That's not very much. Nope. No, it's not. Um, interestingly, uh, that total is about the total of active Scientologists now. Oh, really? Yeah, it's actually a pretty small group uh, altogether. It's been significantly larger in the past. Um, Never millions of members. It it never really peaked over a million. But in the 70s and 80s was its heyday. Yeah. Huh. Okay. And, and, and largely, like, it seems like most, it's hard to get people out at this point, but not many people are enrolling. No, very much not. Very much not. And they're very, very, very reliant on second, third gen members at this point, Mm -hmm. right? Which is something that that Keith really never experienced. It wasn't a multi-generational thing because he wasn't around long enough to make it that way. He was, he tried. Was he he trying though? I was curious. Were 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 they starting to get into the kids? Oh yeah. Yeah. He had a program called Rainbow Cultural Garden. Of course. Yes. And it was basically teaching the children, um, with various uh, uh, nannies, like the child care givers, I guess, I don't know what the, but if they call them MDSs, I'm going to blank on the, what that means, multidisciplinary something, like, an, I forget what Stewards. it is. Stewards. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, some new, you know, some new word that he made up, right? But right. the MDSs were supposed to speak to the children only in that language. And that language was supposed to be like, and, and his, his idea was that the kids would have up to like 11 languages and they, I, I, like there was always with everything in Axiom and Jeunesse and SOP and Rainbow, what we thought it was and then what it actually was. Yeah. So what we think now is that he wanted children to be away from their parents and not have that proper attachment and that proper bond, which is also the foundation of being a sociopath. Yep. Yep. Right. That's right. So that, that's my theory or our theory. I mean, I don't, don't take credit for that, but, um. That would make sense. Anyway, yeah, so he was getting into the children. My son dabbled in that, but in a not toxic way. Like, he's totally fine. And he, we got out when we were three, when he was three. But yeah, he was, it was starting to get multi generational. There were definitely people that were young kids when I joined that were teenagers in, in young 20s when I left. Mm. And those kids are kind of fucked up, I got to say. Like, they've been, they're, they got their, am I allowed to swear on this? I always have to you swear. are okay. totally allowed to okay. swear. I have a huge potty mouth. Yes, me too. You may know from the vow. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm quite bad myself. Um, that's unfortunate. I had not realized that the second gen development had gone that far in that group, and that is unfortunate because that there's a thing, one of the characteristics of these groups that, that we talk about is loaded language, the fact yes. that they change the definitions of words in significant but subtle ways and literally do change the way you think or approach things because of that. It is, it's a fascinating and powerful tool. And if you can raise children on that loaded language where they never had any other concept of those words, then it even makes it even stronger. Yes. I know, I know that it was something that, you know, when I was in and I was having kids or my, or my first child anyway, it was something that we were figuring out, like, how do we raise our kids with, like, are we going to separate them from the rest of society who aren't at cause? Like, we're at cause. And, like, right. you know, then and then there was a story of this, of this, like, kid whose grandmother wasn't an ESP, and the grandmother said, you make me sad when you do that. And we're like, oh, no, that's terrible. That, per- that kid's going to think that the other person can cause that person's emotions. That's not true. Right. <laughs> like, that kind of right. thing. So we were trying to figure out how we were going to, raise our kids and like, you know, we're like, they think we're a cult now. Wait till we start our own commune and and totally isolate from society. Then they're really going to think we're a cult. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't it funny how, how far down the rabbit hole we can go? I mean, you look back on it and you're just like, my God, I, I was in. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it is, it is sometimes the only words that work are, I was a different person. Mm Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah. it, it's so different. It's such a radical change. 
Um, now I was, I was, uh, impressed by, and, and, and something I noticed throughout reading, you know, going through your book and, and looking at your experience and the way you've discussed it and talked about it, there were some aspects of this group that you never fell for, that you always were able to sort of keep a little bit distance from. And I was curious how you managed to pull that off or how that worked for you. Was it the distance thing geographically or was there were there other subtle ways you were able to maintain your own view on things? I think it was a couple of things. One was the distance. I'd never lived in Albany, although in the last couple of years, I was getting major shit for not making that move, mm. which would sound like, Sarah, you're more, you're more, um, what was the word you use? Uh, you're more committed to your attachment to materialism than you are to your growth. <laughs> what do you think it's going to mean to your children that you chose your fancy apartment in Canada versus really committing to working through your issues in Albany? Right. That's what it would sound like. That's right. one particular person whose voice was so annoying. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that that's the kind of stuff I was getting in terms of like the gaslighting and the manipulation. But, you know, also I had a life, even though, even though in, in many ways I'd say like ESP was my life and it was my, my business and my friends and my community. Like I said, I had this community in Vancouver that was like the good parts only, you know? And as you know, there's always good on the outside, right? And then the bad's on the inside and I had the good. And I just like, I didn't do like, like, you know, when they started doing these penances and people were, you know, standing in the snow in the middle of the night to make up for their failures. I was just like, I'm not going to do that. That's just, that's too much for me. And I wasn't raised in any religious way. So that even the concept of penance was really foreign to me. Mm. Um, but I also was like, that's just too extreme. And I, but like I said, I was also obedient. So I realized that I could kind of, and this was not super conscious, conscious, conscious. I wasn't conscious of this <laughs> in my conscience. Okay. I was, it was just because I was also sleep deprived and working so much that I wasn't really like thinking about this, but I was like, there's things you're supposed to do, like enter all your data in, which was incredibly time consuming, but I knew that nobody checked it. Mm -hmm. So you were supposed to report in that you did it. So I would say like, you know, coach points entered, you know, thumbs up or yes, I stood for you for an hour to make up for your, cause we were doing penances for each other to build conscience. Oh, right? wow. So like if we we're on the same team and you didn't, you know, complete the podcast thing that you were supposed to do, I would do something for you. So you'd feel the pain of that, which would motivate your decisions in the future. So I'd be like, wow. okay, because of your failures, Chris, I'm not going to go to yoga all week so that you don't fuck up next time. Right. Right. But right. I, but I, I phone those things in. <laughs> so like, <laughs> so the, not gonna... the external consequences <laughs> didn't bite quite so hard. Yeah, yeah. 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 So like anyone listening to this, who's still loyal to Keith and there are quite a, you know, handful of what we call the loyalists. They'll be like, see, Oh, I knew it. Sarah didn't do the work. That's what they do. Like Sarah, ah. Sarah was super, super, too superficial or whatever. Yep. Like that was another thing I'd get. It was too superficial. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, and also my mom wasn't on board and you know, I, I, I could, I, I, a part of me knew that it was like cheesy, you know, like there's just certain people I never would have invited. Cause they'd be like, wait, sashes Vanguard, <laughs> like <laughs> go fuck yourself. No. So I, 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 there's just part of me that was like a little bit aware of that. So like kind of, even though I was like in, I was also had one foot out always right? in retrospect, I think. Well, it, I find that, I find that interesting. And I, I, I do think the distance thing was a factor. I'm curious how much was your husband, how hardcore was he on this? You know, we went through different stages at different times and I don't want to speak too much for him, but I will say, cause he said it in other interviews, like. He, in the way that I was obedient externally, he was disobedient. He'd be like, I'm not doing that. Mm. <laughs> and like we'd go into a forum and I'd be sitting in the front in a row with my notes if I was allowed to, because you had to be in rank order. And he'd sit on the back and kind of like have his feet up and be on his phone. I'd be like, Nippy, like <laughs> in some ways I was kind of jealous because he didn't care. Like he didn't give a shit, but here's the thing. I was making money and he wasn't. And it was, there's a lot of reasons for that that it's too complicated to explain. So he, his thing was like, what, I'm not going to do it. What are you going to cut my pay? Right? right. So, uh, but for me, I was like, this is my income now. And I had grown dependent. So I was willing to do certain things to, 
you know, be able to uh, not get punished, essentially. So he didn't have that same fear. They would call him in the way they called me superficial or controlling or materialistic. (laughs) They would have called him defiant, you know. He's not being obedient. He's defiant, right? Mm-hmm. Anyone who had their own sense of personhood was defiant. Right. Right. So he would, you know, he wasn't really in in the same committed way. He did like he really picked and chose what he wanted to do. But when they offered him a leadership role with the men's group, that's when he came became more committed. And he he's a you know former college quarterback. He's a leader. He's a natural leader. And up until then, he'd been very, I think, suppressed. And I'm saying not suppressed in the Nexium. Scientology way, but in the real world way of he was being thwarted by the leadership to really grow and step into his own, you know, position of power as a leader. So when he, when that happened, he really took off and was committed to that. Um, but as soon as everything came into picture of what was really going on, I mean, both of us were out so quickly. And we've talked about it since we were we were relieved. Like there were so many things that were off about the company. And also when you that question you asked, like what kept me not like fully in, there mm. were just things that were really not cool about how the company ran. Like I would fill out an application for someone for a five day and the admin office would charge them three times, mm. you know? And I don't really think that like those people were doing it on purpose to make more money. I think it was just clumsy. Like yeah. people were given jobs that they shouldn't have gotten, you know, because they needed work to do work exchanges to basically everybody that ran things in the company weren't paid. They were on work exchanges. Yeah. I was about to ask you how you were, you mentioned you were now, this was now money dependent yeah. for you, how much so. And I, I'm not necessarily talking about dollar figures, but mm-hmm. just how much of your livelihood say dependent on this and how did that kind of work? Yeah, I actually just did an episode with Gabby Dunn on her podcast called Bad With Money. And we talked about all the weird money stuff with Nexium. So we refer to that for all the, those details because I went into a lot of detail about it. But cool. I mean, ultimately it started with, I took a training. I really loved it. I'm very, I'm a natural, what they would call like a natural enroller or basically a recruiter. And it was, if you referred three people, you got your money back, which I did immediately. So I did my first three and then I referred other people and I'm like, well, if you do six, you can become a salesperson. I didn't know how hard it was for normal people to to bring in six people, but I'm not a normal person in that way. Like I'm very social. I'm very passionate about whatever it is that I believe in, whether, and I mean, green juice, yoga, kombucha, raw chocolate, personal development. Like I was just like, this is the thing, do this. And like, that's just me. Right. So I started to make an income off of sales that earned 20% of every commission, which I then put into being able to take more classes and pay for my flights. Like when I started, I was the proverbial broke actress living in a basement suite. So to start being able to earn income that I could pay for these expensive trainings, which started off as 2000 and the next one was 5,000. And I mean, we took trainings that were $15,000 each. Wow. So I had to pay for that. And then when I had my center, when I opened my center was when I became a proctor. And that's when I was actually able to earn 10% of on anything that was in my, in, in my, what they called your organization, in my pyramid underneath me, just basically an MLM. Yeah. Which sidebar, we were told wasn't an MLM because MLMs are unethical. Of course, which is why we can't be an MLM because, of yeah, course, we are ethical. We are. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right? I wish, I wish there were more differences between Nexium and Scientology because <laughs> every single time this topic comes up, just more and more and more comes up of that. When Mike and Leah had me on their podcast, we just were laughing and going through all the different. Oh. I literally took notes watching Going Clear, and I was like, "Oh my god, there's so many similarities." Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what were we just talking about? Well, I was right? mentioned about the money and stuff, and oh, I was just curious how much oh, of that you became yes. income dependent on. So eventually it became, um, I stopped acting, uh, mostly. Like, so the first four years, and by the way, the first four years, I was also working for free. So there, there's the coach, when you're on a coach, you are doing what's called an internship. So when you apply for coach and you have to enroll two people, you have to do a test and you're a coach. And then basically you're the one that's running the groups in all of the trainings. So you're running all the question sets. When when the participants are in break, you're putting out the food or photocopying notes or cleaning toilets or assembling binders. It's, it's a full day. And I don't, I don't know if it's as intense as the Sea Org. 
but it, it sounds mm-hmm. it sounds similar yeah. i put on conferences yeah. i know exactly what you're yeah. talking about you're, yeah, yeah you're full conference mode and you're not you don't get paid for that yep but you are getting paid because you're learning the tech <laughs> right. <laughs> it's an internship yep. it's a practical mba and i'm using that voice to distinguish what we were told and and believed right. um and okay i'm gonna say something this not everyone who's out will agree with me there was some truth in that. I learned some really valuable skills in terms of being a facilitator, in terms of um, eventually I was taught how to speak and train and do all this. And so I did learn a lot. Mm-hmm. I probably could have paid a lot less in terms of my the time for value exchange <laughs> that I put in. And, and the truth of the matter is, and this is a chapter in my book, Illusion of Hope, where the last time I saw Keith and I was doing a, a video presentation for them. And he said, it's important that keep, keep your state up because you present, you want people to buy into the illusion of hope. And I couldn't wrap my head around that until I got out. I was like, oh my God, the whole thing's an illusion. Just like all MLMs and Aaliyah, the whole, like the whole path of growth, the whole thing is a massive fucking scam. Yep. And, um, oh God, what was I just saying about um, illusion of hope? Well, Keith had been, Keith had been presenting this as this, you know, you have to keep, presenting oh, yeah. this to people. Right. So, so, so what I realized is that most coaches and the number that I had heard then, I don't know if this is true, that 10% of every participant, if you have a 30 people, only three of those people would become coaches. And of those three people, only 10% of them would become proctors and you don't get paid till you're a proctor. So not many people got to proctor. Right. Right. And right. so in terms of making Nexium or executive success, your income it took a lot of work yeah. and a lot of work. And I happened to be one of the people that had certain skill sets and they put a lot of effort into me to be the, you know, to prop me up. And like right at the beginning, I had someone invest in me, you know, lent me the money, flew Barbara Boucher, who's um, was my field trainer at the time. And she was one, she actually left before me. And I was a big trailblazer in the exposing Keith Ranieri thing. We can talk about that more later. Yeah. But yeah, she like, you know, took me into her wing. She flew me to Albany for training, things I wouldn't have been able to afford. She invested in me, which was smart because I brought the company millions of dollars in enrollments later. So it, it went from it went from being, you know, working for free to eventually getting to Proctor, earning a lot of money. And then in those in those middle, I call it the middle years because there's four years working for free, four years of like good the golden years, and then a four-year <laughs> slow demise and decline as the company was falling apart. Like, I don't know what Keith was thinking. And I think this is in my book where they pulled all my staff out to take trainings in Albany. So I had no one to run stuff in Vancouver. And when I brought that up as like problematic in the system, I was, the, I was met with, wow, uh, what do you, um, what does it mean that you don't want your students to interface with Keith? Right. What do you, what are you trying to thwart their growth? No, I have a business to run. Like, and I'm dependent on like I, I, I'm a satellite center, right? Anyway, all sorts of shit went down, and really, um, but as, like even though it wasn't as much money towards the end, I still walked away from like a good residual income of five to ten grand a month. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At the end. Yeah, at the end. Right. So that and that was the bad years. <laughs> so it 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 would change. It changed over the twelve years, but ultimately they used me as the poster child of like, look, Sarah Edmondson, you know, aspiring actress living in a basement suite can get to this level. So can you. Yep. Illusion illusion of hope. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. And interesting how every time you've described the responses from the organization or the official responses or replies, the gaslighting that you would receive when you asked any sort of questions or, or, or uttered any kind of complaint was always an introverted statement. It was always directed back at you and your personal intent, or I should mm-hmm. say ill intent. Ill intent, yeah. Toward Keith it, or toward the organization. So it does, so it's kind of it, it's a trick because it's no matter what you do, this question or this framing can be can be twisted to make it out that you're somehow doing something bad. And it's again, I I only wanted to point it out because it's been a, a common thing you've brought up again and again and again in terms of how they controlled you. Yes. And then you just reminded me of something else, even if it wasn't like, I remember one time making a, a statement about how the admin was like, we're a success program. We need to have an admin that's on point, <laughs> you know? And the response was same, same person. 
Sarah, this is a humanitarian organization. People are going to fail and grow. Right. So she's not putting it back onto me, but she is because basically me saying it means I'm not humanitarian. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Right? Always a little twist. Always, Always a, little a little twist. twist. That's yeah. right. Well, okay. So coming coming around to the back end of this. Yes. Um, okay. So you. So this is how you kind of maintained a little bit of, uh, dare I say, critical thinking, or you know, at least some ability to 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 be skeptical, or at least you know, question some things. And then once your husband found his groover, they kind of got him on his groove. He started getting excited about it. But what was it that? Where did it become, um, you know, oh, no, 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 no. This has got to stop. Was it the branding? Is that when it became I, I would say super even clear? Yeah. I mean, even before that, it was, I was, things were happening that I was, you know, the shelf metaphor, putting on the shelf, mm. right? Like, okay, they couldn't wrap my head around, put that on the shelf. Hmm, don't know about that. Like, even just being in DOS and committing to it, which at the beginning was like kind of exciting. And it's a secret women's group and nobody knows about it. And then I'm in. And then, and now that you're in, um, you need to give new collateral every month. Now I've just made a lifetime commitment, right? New collateral every month. Like, what could that possibly even be? Right. You know? Oh God, how am I going to get out of this? And then the branding was so brilliant because it really was set up in a way to have us go through this thing that was really challenging. And before I knew it was Keith's initials, I was proud of it. I was like, I I got through that and I yeah. was proud of I was proud of myself. And um I thought I'd overcome a big thing. Like you can also experience doing a triathlon or something. Yep. You don't have to do branding without anesthetic in your, you know, most sensitive region of your body. But I it was really, yeah, I think the no, 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 that I'm out was talking to Mark. We had a conversation where he had me sign an NDA because he had left and I didn't know why. And he wouldn't tell me why until I had signed an NDA. And this is all, this is also all in the vow and it also not fully explained in the vow. Like I think watching the vow and reading my book kind of explains the series of events, which were very complicated and a lot of things happened, but ultimately it was a conversation where we were speaking openly and he had found out that some women were part of a secret thing and had been given an assignment to, to have sex with Keith. And I didn't know about that, but I knew about the branding. So as soon as he, so as soon as he said that, I, I saw like the big picture, I told him about the branding and then he saw the big picture and we put it together and we were like, oh my God, this is like a blackmail MLM sex ring scheme yep and so like which goes back to what i try to say in almost every inter interview that like people are like what's so sex cult i'm like you have to understand for most people who took this training it was not a sex cult it yep. was a personal and professional development program to help people with their goals and work through their emotional reactivity and be the best versions of themselves right. that's it Back for life. the people who went to the next level <laughs> and like really committed, it was also a sex cult right. and had been from the beginning, but just kept behind closed doors. We just didn't know. So I yeah. was impressed. I got to comment on this because it's the area I think of most confidentiality that I've run across in, in, in the Nexium operation was how effective Keith was at siloing information, yes. who knew what, at what level and where, even to the very top where I think you wrote Nancy Salzman, who was basically his partner in crime for this whole thing from the beginning, didn't mm -hmm. even know that DOS existed or knew about it, but didn't know about the sex or like even there, there was siloing. Is yeah, that accurate? I mean, she, yeah, it, it is accurate. She did. It turns out that she did know that he was having sex with people, but yeah. had made it okay in her mind that it was part of the therapy. Ah. It was it was mentoring people and sexual because she was one of the first ones. Of course. Right. So course. she knew that that was part of the deal. Okay. Um, and then lied about it. Right. She directly told people that he was celibate because in her mind, it wasn't, people weren't integrated enough on sex to understand what he was doing. Isn't that interesting, that point? I, I want to highlight that for just a yeah. second, because we have the same thing in Scientology and other places where you come to a level of arrogance because of the knowledge you believe you have, or in Nancy's case, even help develop. Mm -hmm. And 
you know the truth, but you know everybody else can't handle the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, so you become the gatekeeper of the truth in your own mind. Yes. And also there's this thing that they did, and it was even in the curriculum about like lying and honesty and stuff. And there's this thing called the ethical lie. And it's the the metaphor that they use, and it's terrible and especially feel terrible using it because my heritage is Jewish. And they talked about being in World War II. And if you're, say, Polish and you're hiding Jews in the basement from the SS officers, of course you lie to uphold life. So this then became what's called the Jews in the basement lie. Uh, and so I know it's terrible. So uh, it was then referred to as that. So I know that there's still people out there lying to protect Keith. And it's okay to them. Isn't there the equivalent, the greater good of all goods or something? Oh, it's intelligent? actually worse. I'll, t I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll share this with you because it's, yeah. it's so parallel. An acceptable truth. Mm, right. Scientology yes. has an acceptable truth. That's a, an actual thing Hubbard said. You tell the acceptable truth, not the full actual truth, because the right. truth won't be accepted. Yes. And so it's okay to lie if yep. you're protecting Keith or the Jews in the basement. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The analogy so, is perfectly parallel to Scientology yeah. in that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, well, that, of course, actually does lead me to ex the, my next question, which was I was wondering now, you know, so the organization has been destroyed in that its head is in jail and he's never coming out. Uh, the other principals have had uh, prison sentences. I, I, I'm curious about your take on those, but I'm, but first, how... How many are still loyal? How many loyalists are we talking about? A tiny little handful, or is there an actual group still going? We don't really know exactly. There's about um, like five to ten people who are who are out or not out and are like loud on social media and you know like to make little videos and and write blogs and tweet about their beliefs around how Keith didn't have due process. Okay. Um, which, by the way, if, if anyone wants to know about that, we interviewed Moira Penza on A Little Bit Culty, the prosecutor who took took down Keith, and she was just laughing about how he had the most due process than anyone in history. <laughs> With, like, the best lawyers money could buy and a six-week you know, um, trial and a unbiased jury and, you know, yeah. anyway. So I would say probably... <laughs> around 20 to 50, like max a hundred, but we don't know for sure. There's probably a lot of people who haven't left, don't really do much with it anymore, but, but still believe that Keith is like good. And this was all, you know, he's a martyr and right. you know, me and Nippy, Mark, Bonnie, Catherine, like we're so bad, you know, that kind yes. of thing. But there's just people who are actively fighting to get him out of jail. It's quite a small handful of, of loyalists. Also Nippy calls them the flat earthers. Yeah, yeah, that's an, that's another that's a great analogy for that because that's 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 kind of how that works out. There's mm -hmm. a there's a tremendous amount of outrage and curiosity and upset about flat earthers, and a very very small number of them. Yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, actually, when you actually go engage with them directly, there's, which there's I've like done, seven. Yeah, it's tiny. I mean, that. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way: the International Flat Earth Conference was held here in Denver about three or four years ago, and I went. Oh, really? Yeah, because I wanted to do some direct research, and yeah. um, and it, it was it was a very pathetically small group of people. Okay. Um, now. How, uh, what, what are your thoughts now on the punishment? Cause I, cause Rainier got a hundred and, and, oh, I'm, I'm constantly screwing this up. Is it Rainier? Rainier? Rainier, Rainier, like Canary, Rainier, like Rainier, like Canary. Rainier, like canary. Oh, canary. like yeah, Canary. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Good. That, that helps. That'll help Rainier. me remember it. Yeah. <laughs> cause it, it's like Alistair Crowley, like holy, you know, <laughs> like, oh, okay, okay. good. <laughs> I always um, do the same thing with Mike Rinder. Is it Rinder or Rinder? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah Rinder, Rinder, right? Mike Rinder? Mike Rinder. Oh, is it Rinder? Rinder. I thought it was Rinder. Oh, no, I've always called him Rinder. I got to hope I'm not that. wrong. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I've called it to him to his face. I, I think it's Rinder. <laughs> I'm going to double check that and get back. Yeah, to you might want to check that. Don't <laughs> yeah. take my word for that. Okay. But, um, but what were your thoughts on the punishments that were handed down to Mac, Nancy Salzman, some of the other, you know, principals? Uh, I think Laura yeah, Salzman. Lauren. You know what? Um, I've said this publicly and I'll, I'll say it again and I, I know not everyone agrees with me in the in the out group but generally I really feel like judge judge Garifus mm -hmm. was really 
smart. And thank goodness we had such a, um, just like a judge that was really willing to take the time to fully understand the scope of this. Mm. It's not a, it's, it's a, it's a very complicated, nuanced subject, you know, coercive control and sex trafficking and forced labor and, and all, and then, um, conspiracy to commit these things. And then the role of like the rank of people and who was a victim and who was a perpetrator and, and also what was he considered really heavily is were the people contrite and were they awake and were they apologetic and were they aware and were they still backing Keith or not? Right. So that affected hit the, their, you know, their, um, their jail times or, or lack of in Lauren's case, she's had time served being on, and it was three years per, you know, three years on house arrest. And, and she is not going to jail. So she's, she's, um, only serving, uh, only on probation. Okay. Nancy's going for three years. Uh, Na- uh, Allison is around just over three years. Claire is over eight or seven or eight. I forget exactly now, but, um, some people think that's not enough. Um, but that was like considering her crimes, it was two or three times more than what the prosecutor even asked for. But the judge was very clear that until she is like denounces Keith and she refused to. So I, if someone's looking at this case from the outside and doesn't have all of those things and um, might look at somebody like Nancy and be like, what, like how, how can she get three and Keith get one twenty? I think the judge took into account that she's older, you know, and that she was also a victim, but the fact is she perpetrated his mission and knew a lot of things and didn't do the right thing about it. So I don't know. I think if anyone could have had a bit more, I would say Nancy, but I also think three years for a, you know, a senior is a lot. So, you know, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I'm not going to debate this with you. I agree with you. I, Mm -hmm. I, my position is that, you know, that generally speaking, people don't understand coercive control mm-hmm. and they don't tend to understand the nuance. And this is what I, I, I try to harp on on my show is, is it's not an either or mm-hmm. you're not a victim or a victimizer in a, yeah. in a situation like this. You are, you hold both roles actively yeah, and purposefully. I mean, with yeah. intent and, yeah. and I did it. You did it. We, we, yeah. I mean, when you're in those groups and you rise to a certain level, that's just what happens. Yes. And you have all the regrets coming out of having done that to other people. I've profusely apologized many times yes, publicly same. and privately, right? Because um, you feel like a heel. You feel like a complete asshole, you know, for yeah. having done all that shit to people, thinking you were helping them by hurting them or abusing them. Mm-hmm. So it's a difficult, and, and it's some people have a very, very hard time wrapping their head around that idea mm-hmm. that you can be both at the same time. You know, you yeah. can be coerced into coercing others. But the fact of the matter is none of these models work. MLM doesn't work if you don't do that. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's just the fact of it, but it's an uncomfortable truth. A lot of people don't want to, don't want to deal with. Yeah, it's actually one of the things I first worked on with Dan Shaw, who is my mm. you know, my cult therapist when I got out. And you know, oh, Dan. Been, yeah, yeah, he's I been love on the Dan. show. He's a good guy. It was yes, ours too. Yeah, he's yeah. he's great. And he helped me see because there was somebody who was like very publicly saying that I was terrible to work for, I was abusive, and I was like, you know, gutted, but I also had to, you know, face where I had been. And Dan helped me see like when the head of an organization is abusive and gaslighting and abuse verbally, not physically, obviously, um, is not to say that's, that's not, not, not okay. I'm just saying in case people are wondering what I'm talking about. Um, but when the, when the leader is that way, that's how we are taught to work with people. And, and, and again, like still apologizing, never will stop (laughs) apologizing probably, but also to forgive myself for that behavior, knowing that like, that was, that was part of the doctrine is, is, dealing with people in that way. And it's what we learned. Right. So, right. um, how do we get on that subject? Oh yeah. So I, I feel that way with all of those people, mm. you know, that they were both. And I agree with you. And for me, where different lines are drawn is like, did you do those things? And then like lie, like, I, I know for me, I never lied to anybody mm. about what I was selling or, you know, 
when I brought people in, I was telling the truth. Whereas, whereas Nancy's very specifically lied to people saying, Keith is celibate, Keith is renunciate, Keith is the smartest man in the world based on nothing. You know, like there was a whole series of lies that she, that she, you know, propped up to, to keep him propped up. So yeah, I mean, all in all, I think that karma's a bitch and, um, you know, she'll have to face all those people have to face what they did just as I have in their own time. And hopefully they will, and they'll, you know, be able to move on with it. I, all I want right now is for people to move on with their lives and, you know, get what they wanted, which is to be healthy and happy and, you know, have meaning in their lives. And I hope that they do. I really do. I have zero anger for anyone anymore. Interesting. Well, good on you for that. Having come to that place, um, you know, after, Many years. Uh, well, years. after having not yeah. been out for that long, I mean, yeah. this is actually kind of recent history. <laughs> yes. Although when, when I wrote the book, I think I was still pretty angry. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. And now I, I'm just like, uh, I've got, you know, I've got two kids. Isn't, there's no room in my energy field for that. So yeah. my heart. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Did I, I have not followed Nancy closely enough post try on all of that. Did she, did she appear contrite did did she it's, does it's it look like she's know. it's hard to know because i wasn't in the courtroom okay i didn't go i felt like that already taken up enough of my time um but from what i heard and like what i read when i read her words and her, her statement and stuff mm-hmm. she's saying all the right things you know what i mean mm-hmm. but she also i feel like didn't do the right things like lauren wrote me a really wonderful letter oh did she and, yeah and was very apologetic and it felt very heartfelt Oh, good. Yeah. Whereas, but Nancy didn't do that. And, you know, I, I just feel like she's just still kind of a bit arrogant and a little bit like doing the whole, well, we were all just duped and he's just a sociopath. And like, she is denouncing him, which is good, but like, hasn't really owned like, but that maybe she was really awful too. And was really yeah. abusive to a lot of people. So that's the part where I'm like, Okay, Nancy, like, you know, you got you got to do both. And she yeah. was really she was a really she she I mean, and, and here's the thing, I didn't even really know I was okay at the trial. And then I heard some of the other victim impact statements of the things that she did. And I was like, Oh, man. You got you, you got a you got a lot of letters to write. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. Nancy's the only one I still have question marks in my mind in terms mm-hmm. of the you know, I, I believe Allison Mack was sincere. I think she was yeah. kind of in shock, <laughs> frankly. Yes. You yeah. Know. And I think she was sincere too. And yeah. I, and I think that, you know, there's been other people who publicly said that she's a monster and things like that. I don't think that at all. I think she, she got caught up in something that sort of was a, a good outlet for any, I don't even want to say narcissism because it's sort of like the typical actor and myself included, you know, mm-hmm. actor sort of she got she got given a position of power that was not healthy for her and she ran yeah. with it you know yeah. but i don't think she set out to hurt people no and i think that i think that a way that we differentiate for me the way i think about it that makes the most sense to me and I can and I can still maintain some faith in people. <laughs> it's, and maybe maybe it's only for that reason, but I think there's more. Is I think there are things called I think there are people who are um empathic who can be weaponized, as we say. We, you can mm-hmm. weaponize an empath. You can take a person who basically cares about other people, mm-hmm. indoctrinate them that abusing those other people is the best way to help them and get them to believe it. Mm-hmm. And then they, you will not, ne- you will not have a harder worker, right? A person who will give up weekends, holidays, everything they can because they believe they are helping other people, but in fact yep. are abusing the hell out of them. And I, I, I personally believe that's where Allison Mack was at. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you might be right. Yeah, uh, I don't think Keith was that, and I no. and I and I have questions about Nancy on that regard because she was such a early and avid, energetic contributor to what Keith was doing that I mm-hmm. I really have to question her basic intent. But but mm-hmm. that's that that's from a distance. I don't know her. Yeah. I've never interacted with her. So yeah. 
what do I know about that stuff? But I did find it interesting. Um, one last thing I think I'll ask you about, and then I think we're going to have to start wrapping up, is um, I found it interesting that there are no victims in Nexium in the same way there are no victims in Scientology. It's a dogmatic point, approach. You, you cannot ever be victim, uh, a victim or be victimized. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does that play out in the Nexium? indoctrination so yeah nippy and i love to talk about this like picking apart the doctrine and like figuring out what was good about it and then what was bad about it and how it could be used to abuse and i think what was good about it is that in any situation that you're unhappy with or something that happens to you or in your life that isn't good you can look at it from the perspective of like okay how did what was my role in this you know Mm -hmm. how did i participate in, in this and you go from being oh my god this thing happened to me to being like okay in a healthy way, it would be, what would I do differently next time? Mm-hmm. You know, in this situation, I'm just trying to think of an example. Um, I don't know, like a, a business deal that's go, that goes awry or something, you know, and you go, oh my God, this guy did this, or even conned me, you know, or something like that. You can, you can go from, I've been victimized from this person go, okay, what did I, okay, well, I didn't do my due diligence. You know, I didn't, and this is the same thing with me and Keith, like I didn't look him up. Right. Uh-huh. This is my responsibility in this whole thing. I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't look it up on the internet beforehand. I did it on day one and I was already kind of trying to get my money back. Um, and, you know, I didn't talk to X members and all the things I advise anyone who's about to join a group now. I didn't do those things. Yep. And I, this is, this is me using the Nexium tools to like analyze how I t- could have taken more responsibility, right? I trusted Mark. I put my trust in Mark. I had an expectation that he knew things that I didn't know. And I personally underestimated people's capacity to lie, mm-hmm. right? So there's, there's some things where I could have taken responsibility. Doesn't, but now what, what I know, what's bad about it is it doesn't give the person who's doing the abusing <laughs> any responsibility. That's right? it right there. Right. That's it. So, so it's possible that, yes, I can take responsibility for those things. Same with DOS. I said, yes, I will do this. Yes, I gave a photo, a, a nude photo to Lauren so it could be a part of this thing. I committed. I consented. I could have asked more questions. Well, I did ask questions. She said I didn't need to know and I was being controlling. So I stopped asking questions. <laughs> Doesn't mean that they didn't victimize me yes. by putting Keith's initials on my body. So the good of it, you take responsibility, you feel more, the, the, the way it was used in Nexium is like, when you take responsibility for something and not be a victim, you have more potency in your life and you see more options. And that's a good thing. Yep. Yeah. The bad of it, I think I just explained. Um, and that was actually what Moira Penns, the prosecutor said on our podcast was like, that was the thing that chaps, chaps her ass, which is one of our segments <laughs> the most <laughs> is that this whole, you, you can't be a victim. There's being a victim is there's no room for that in Nexium. And yet now Keith is the ultimate victim. Keith is a victim to the judicial process mm-hmm. who, you know, steamrolled him and blah, 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 blah. And you know, the media was so unethical and Keith is a victim. Like, okay, Keith, let's use the tools. What could you have done differently? Exactly. You know, what, what areas of reality were you not aware of that caused you to make those decisions? Like, there's, a, there's a whole set of questions we had. Like, <laughs> in SOP was like, how did you author it? How wow. did you cause it? What's your role in it? I mean, gaslighting wow. at, at its extreme. Anything could be like, well, how'd you cause it? Right. Yeah, right? you can always flip it on, on a person. Yeah. And then, yeah, so yeah. I'm going to flip it right the fuck back on Keith. You know, Keith, how the fuck did you cause? How did you think this was going to go? Exactly. Putting your initials on a bunch of married women? Go fuck yourself. Sorry. That's <laughs> no. where I get all riled up still. So. I get it. I get it. And and uh, and you are uh, not alone <laughs> in this. <laughs> yeah. It takes nothing to get me riled up on this stuff. I, I read about what this guy did, and I just want to go punch him in the face. It's 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 quite horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're not alone on that. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I mean, in a way, there's a certain degree of, of satisfaction, you know, in the, in our sort of tit for tat justice, you know, primal justice instincts we have that, you know, Keith's probably going to get a good punch in the face quite a few times at the place that he's at now. And yes, I, deservedly so, you know. Yes. Among other things. Yeah, exactly. Well, he's not in a position where he holds any power now. And, yeah. uh, you know, and he's going to, Learn that that's not a great place to be. Nope. Uh, yeah. Did you know, by the way, uh, SOP, even SOP, uh, early Scientology process, really? ser- series of processes, SOP this, SOP 8C, SOP this, SOP that. Oh. 
Yeah, just so many parallels. It's just every single time I approach Nexium, something else props out that is that is not a coincidence. It can't be a coincidental. Can't be. No, you know, he was parallel. too lazy to come up with his own curriculum. He had to steal. Right, and, and and of course Hubbard was just stealing, you know, wholesale from Madame Blavatsky and Crowley, and you know, uh, <laughs> stealing a, wholesale. I love it. Yeah. Wholesale, just absolutely, just taking it all and just calling it new names. Just basically, yeah. basically right out of the occult. Hubbard, Hubbard gave it the religious spin. And when you put faith into the picture, it, it kind of ramps it up in a different way. But no, I'm not going to say a more powerful way because what Keith did with and what Nancy did with, with their, um, you know, their NLP background and their psych background and the manipulation techniques they used was quite genius. Mm -hmm. It was quite clever. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for sure. Got away with it for a number of years. Um, well, congratulations, I want to say, on really putting it to bed. Thank you. Yeah, I feel really, I feel good about it. I feel really, like, relieved on a daily basis and, you know, hope for the future. And and I hope that these things take, you know, have precedent in, in Scientology and with the JWs and other groups that are high demand or using course of control. I really do. And if... If it affects it in any way, then I will sleep even better at night. <laughs> exactly. Well, every little bit, another brick in the wall, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's how we build this thing. And, uh, and it's just going to take that until we, you know, until we can have our sort of New York Times moment as well, mm -hmm. you know, yes. is, is kind of what's needed with that and, and all of these groups. And so it's a, it's yeah. a slow, steady thing. Marathon, mm -hmm. not a sprint. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to be on my podcast. I really do appreciate it. And I would love to do this again because there's only sure. about another billion questions I have for you. So, <laughs> And I can't wait to have you on ours too in the new year. Awesome. Awesome. Definitely looking forward to it. All right, folks, I want to, um, I'm going to put links to uh, Sarah's book and uh, podcast in the description section here. Sarah, is there any other thing people should know about you or how to get in touch with you if they want to? Sure. Yeah, I think the best way is to message me on Instagram. It's my full name, Sarah Edmondson, E-D-M-O-N-D-S-O-N. -E -N -N. Um, our podcast is there too, a little bit culty. And also, I'm sure, Chris, you're familiar with the hashtag I got out movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's I feel I feel like is a really great resource for people who are coming out and, and need some healthy, not culty community yes. and want to like get rid of the shame that comes with recognizing you've been conned. And I'm really proud to be a part of that. So you can find me there, Instagram. I'm kind of on Twitter, but not really. But cool. Mostly mostly Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, folks, reach out to her, find engage with her work, read her book, uh, check out Thank her you, podcast. Chris. It's all good stuff. Thank you. All right, guys. I will see you next week. Bye-bye.